Ahoy! Today we're taking a closer look at the patch notes for the Gilgamesh patch, patch 8.4, as well as the bonus balance patch 8.3. Let's jump into the bonus balance first and then look at the big patch afterwards. We have cool new skins here, as usual. Just a quick glance at those. We're getting right to the balance. The first nerf here is to Janos. Uh, this is a nerf to threshold, decreasing the movement speed bonus. Uh, that triggers uh, from passive that triggers on portals and threshold from 10 to 30 percent to 10 to 20 percent uh, this is kind of a bit surprising to some people i think because janus has been very valued but not overperforming really um so you might not perceive this nerf as warranted and that was my first impression as well but after his uh, fix not after the buff that he got but after the fix for the portal that made that work a little bit differently his win rate actually went up just a little bit higher over 50 percent and i think they just want to make sure that it doesn't go too high uh, with this change also probably not having a drastic impact on it it's, it's probably just going to go down very very slightly so overall it's just going to put him uh, in the middle i suppose at least and he's probably still going to be very valued so very contested pick very banned pick uh, so that's probably not going to change much through this change uh, and therefore i don't think it's as bad as i initially thought the second change here is to Tsukuyomi. Tsukuyomi um, needed something, I think, still. I think he was still uh, doing pretty well and very easy to, to perform with. And he gets multiple nerfs. Uh, the first one here is to Dark Shuriken, decreasing the base damage of the projectile uh, from 85 to 285 to 75 to 275. Uh, and along with that, the base damage of the final hit of his two, Kusari Gamma, uh, is reduced from 60 to 280 to 50 to 270. So what I can see here is um, the, the late game nerfs. I can understand that. I think that's very reasonable to uh, take down a little bit of his late game damage. I find it surprising that they uh, targeted the early damage so much with both base damage values being decreased uh, on the early damage as well. And I find that surprising, especially for Dark Shuriken. I felt that Dark Shuriken, uh, as, an, as a projectile ability, was doing a reasonable amount uh, of damage in early stages, and it was more in later stages that it was too strong. So now I would think that he's probably actually in a relatively uh, balanced state, if maybe not even, you know nerfed a little bit too drastically it wouldn't destroy him of course he's a, he's got a good kit overall i just think that other assassins uh, might outshine him significantly after this but we'll find out i just thought that the uh, the combination of two base damage nerfs that usually have a quite high impact uh, if they hit rank one uh, was surprising the next nerf uh, is less surprising it's guan yu his conviction cooldowns uh, being increased from 12 to 14 seconds and his warrior will a warrior's will cooldown is being increased from 12 to 14 seconds. This also makes sense because he can reduce cooldowns anyways. So yeah, just making the base cooldowns a little bit higher is going to work against that to a degree that doesn't hurt anyone. It's full like that. <laughs> so I think these are very reasonable nerfs. He was a top performing guard, like one of the highest win rates in the game. So yeah, good stuff. Then we have Aphrodite, who also gets a nerf. Uh, Lovebirds increased cooldown from 12 to 14 seconds. She also wasn't really hit all too hard by the healer changes, nerfs, tweaks. Uh, she was just performing very well overall. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been obnoxious to deal with, honestly. So I'm fine with this nerf. I know that some people will be frustrated with this nerf as well. Uh, but I think it's a reasonable nerf with how good she has been. Apollo gets another nerf slash revert. Uh, Serenade decreased physical protections from 15 to 35 seconds to 10 to 30 seconds and decrease the mesmerized duration from 1.5 to 2.3 to 1.2 to 2.0 seconds this second part is especially important because it means it's much harder for him to get away in his ultimate after using his two um because you know it's more of a risk of you actually being hit during the the wind up time i think i think it's longer than two seconds um I think the protection reduction here is also very reasonable. I think the ability is still extremely strong. I think this is one of the most underrated uh, abilities in the game. I think this is one of the strongest parts of Apollo's kit because it's an instant CC, an instant AoE CC, which makes it incredibly hard to gank him. Uh, and I still think this needs a wind up. I'm still gonna make my Apollo rant, I think. <laughs> I think that's not gonna change. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, 
they, they mention it here. It's a surprisingly song she see in, uh, in self feelability. So, not really surprising when you think about what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's one of the strongest CCs that we have on Hunters, excluding Ultimates. Then we have Nemesis, who also gets a nerf, decreasing the shield of retribution from 100 to 500 to 100 to 420. Uh, this one is a little bit odd to me, because normally you don't box into the shield, you CC into the shield, so that uh, it won't be an issue. And if you can't CC into the shield, then you're probably better off not fighting into it in the first place. I think Nemesis is very strong at the moment. I think her stats prove that. Uh, I think a, a shield nerf is not what she needs. I think she needs base damage changes. She needs maybe changes to her two to basic attack damage. Something like that, you know, that just levels her out. I don't think the big problem with Nemesis was the ult, um, which of course she can sometimes use very effectively to reflect damage from like a big ultimate coming onto her or something, but I don't know. I feel like this is not what she needed, and I think it's unfortunate that they just keep nerfing everything that is going in the terms of reflecting, countering. They just don't like those things, and I like them, so I think it's sad. And that brings us to the second part, which is to Gilgamesh. Actually, let's zoom in a little bit. I think we can do that. It, it, on the other one, I think it screwed up the formatting before, so be careful with that, but uh, I think we can do it here. All right, so first of all, we have the passive, Epic of Gilgamesh. He gets two quests. The first quest is on level 5, uh, you need to sp visit a specific location on the map, which changes every game. Uh, and when you go there, you get an item. Um, this, this quest uh, area is somewhere close to the enemy uh, base. So apparently they said, uh, for example, if you hit level 5 on solo side, then it'll be somewhere between the harpies and the enemy speed buff, roughly. Uh, and if you hit level 5 somewhere on the duo side, then it'll be, you know, somewhere up there by the red buff, purple buff, or maybe higher up by the harpies. So it, the area corresponds with where you hit level 5 and then on the enemy side of the map. So you have a rough idea of where it will be. And then the second quest is you have to get um, basically three kills or assists in a single fight. Uh, so you have to to wipe half the enemy team, more than half the enemy team, um, with your team, and then you get another item. And uh, if you, in one of these scenarios, have six item slots filled, then you get 500 gold. So a fair bit of RNG here, because random item, and because it might actually be good to just get the 500 gold towards the end, I don't know. But uh, yeah, very, very interesting mechanic overall. And I don't know how I feel about it yet. I have to see how it's in-game, you know. How much you can really do with items that you're not planning to build, maybe. Could be interesting. It can always pay off if it's an item you need in the moment. Or it can be something that just feels completely out of place for you. Then we have Sunforged Scimitar. This is a stim steroid uh, with a radius of 20 because then it has an initial AoE. So first he ignites his sword and there's like a, a fire AoE around him. The lit up sword lasts for 4 seconds, then enemies uh, take ignition damage initially and are slowed for 2.5 seconds. This damage value is here, uh, 65 to 205 plus 60% of your physical power, that is uh, the ignition damage. And then the slow uh, is from the ignition as well, uh, 15 to 25% for 2.5 seconds. After that, Gilgamesh's basic attack deal bonus damage equal to 3.5% of his maximum health to enemies hit. When Gilgamesh successfully hits an enemy with his basic attack, the duration of this effect is extended for 0.8 seconds up to a maximum of 12 seconds. Now, they said initially that this was infinite. It's not. It has a maximum of 12 seconds. But the cooldown of this ability scales down from 14 to 10 seconds. And if you activate this ability, it goes on cooldown immediately. So if you are able to keep this up for 12 seconds and you have it on rank 3, then it'll automatically be infinite because you can just use the ability again. And the only difference between this and just being purely infinite is that you use 60 mana every time you use it. Uh, but you also get the extra damage in between every time you use it, so I would say that's worth it, and you get the extra slow. It's unlikely you're going to stick that long to an enemy anyways, but just to, to clarify that. Uh, the effect overall is kind of uh, very similar to animosity. Animosity dealing 4%. Of the enemy's maximum health. Uh, this one I think is physical though, it doesn't specify but I'm assuming it's uh, physical damage because the rest of the kit here on the abilities and everything is physical. So yeah, interesting one. 
Um, that obviously synergizes with building a decent amount of health, also synergizes uh, with building attack speed items, just to keep it going and to get more procs of this. I, I can't say how good it is, really, because we, the only scenario we've seen animosity so far was as a separate item, where the downside was always that the item doesn't provide any attack speed, and it was magical damage, which kind of offsets the downside uh, of it being countered by defense as much, whereas this will be more countered and it's slightly less damage, uh, but you have more room to build attack speed at the same time. So I, I don't know where it will end up. It's a very, very interesting in-between spot. Uh, it's also kind of tough if you build him towards attack speed. You have to, uh, a rough early game, I think, because he doesn't have a cleave as far as I'm aware. It's not mentioned anywhere, at least. Uh, and his other abilities don't really work that well with attack speed, I would say. We, we get to some that can kind of work with it, in a way. Um, now maybe they do. It's, it's, it's weird to say. So it's, it's a weird scenario, anyways. But um, I think it's definitely an interesting mechanic, and that's going to be interesting what that means for him in terms of builds. Aside of, obviously, animosity being very interesting, mm, especially if you consider playing him in support, he might be one of the supports where you can actually justify building that, which are, <laughs> there are not very many of, uh, without it just being a meme. And yeah, you can obviously also build that in solo by skipping starters. And then we have uh, Dropkick, his um, main bullying ability, I would say. So there's a line ability with a range of 25, and I'm pretty sure, not 100% sure, but I think... Think, well, no, no, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I'm not sure if 25 units range is enough to hit a full wave, but I don't think it is. I think you only hit half a wave with this. So as a clearing ability, I think it's not that great from that perspective. But moving on, there's, there's a lot of stuff with this ability. So, Gilgamesh drop kicks an area in front of him. He moves forward while doing that. Enemies in that area are damaged, while the closest enemy is launched through these enemies. It doesn't state anything about enemies uh, specifically being guards here. Uh, I don't know if you can drop kick minions. I don't think they showed that actually. Um, or if you can launch minions rather. Um, we'll find out. The launch, and what would happen if you dash through multiple enemies and the first one's a minion and the other one is a guard. So basically can the enemy stand in the enemy minions to avoid your drop kick, which would be kind of weird. The launched enemy takes bonus damage when hitting a minion or takes burst damage and is stunned when hitting a guard or a wall. So think of it a little bit like uh, Anher Impale, uh, or Kuzumbo Push, I guess, also kind of does that, where you take uh, damage. But then also, um, when it hits another guard, they like both of them will be CC'd. Uh, if the yeah, launch enemy hits the Winds of the Mash, which is the ultimate, uh, they're thrown towards the center of the ring. They're also stunned, I think, and yeah, basically the same mechanic as hitting a wall. Uh, minions hit by the launched uh, enemy take bonus damage. So the, mini <laughs> the, 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 the enemy that's launched takes damage for hitting minions, but the minions also take damage when hit by the launched enemy. The gods hit by the launched enemy take burst damage and are stunned. So the kick damage itself is 70 to 190 plus 50% of your physical power. Fair enough. This bonus damage here uh, is for the minions, which is 25 to 85 plus 25% of your physical power. It's not specified if there's a limit to this. If there is not a limit to this, this could be very interesting if you kick an enemy through full wave, because it has that range. Because that would mean that effectively this ability would get 150% scaling from there. Not that much base damage. Well, still a lot. No, still a lot of base damage actually as well. And, and all that scaling. Um, and then the, the, the scaling of the initial kick from that as well. Uh, so we're talking about 200% scaling here. I don't think that's how it is. I, I think um, there's some limiter here, maybe where you, it just procs on, on one minion. Um, because otherwise I don't see how this could possibly be survivable. Uh, even though there are other enemies that can do similar things, like Kuzumbo Push can do like 200 base damage. Uh, per per target, I think. But yeah, I think with how easy this would be to confirm in comparison, I, I would be surprised. And then also the fact that if you get angle the wrong way, you can also be, get, get hit into a wall. Because then that, that's the other option, right? If you get hit into a wall or uh, into an enemy guard, then there's the burst damage here, which is 70 uh, to 250 plus 65% of your physical power. The stun duration here is 1.1 to 1.5 seconds. So not the longest stun, but also not bad either. 
uh, mana cost 60 to 80 and a cooldown of 14 seconds relatively long cooldown here um i think i think it's very interesting if you actually hit the kick on someone and just hit them into a wall that's already uh 115 percent scaling right here so quite a decent amount of damage and we got uh what is that 440 base damage along with that i think Bologna's too might be around that realm somewhere if you hit both parts so uh, it's not something like unheard of but it's definitely a pretty high amount of damage and uh yeah i, I really wonder how exactly it'll interact with the wave uh, if it might be worth more to kick the enemy through the wave and then also use that as a clear that really depends on how exactly this ability works in that context even though the uh, damage it will deal to minions itself wouldn't be the highest anyways it would be uh, 85 the minions whereas here like for example you get uh, 205 on half the wave so yeah i i don't quite know how it'll work but it'll definitely be a very interesting bully mechanic on on his end and that's how, it meant, how it's meant to be then it's hero's advance which is a leap with a range of 50 and a large area that forms afterwards so uh, he leaps into the air crash down a target location uh, interesting enough this is not like the super high leap that that we saw before i think that's actually not in his kit at all after all uh <laughs> I think that was basically just a combo old or something. I think this leap doesn't look high enough to have been that. Maybe, I don't know. It looks kind of like a Raven ult. He just goes up and then like smashes down. Enemies around the impact take damage. Gigamesh just fuses the ground with energy, causing a beacon to appear for five seconds. And now the more proud part. Allies who run towards the beacon will gain a movement speed, halving once they enter the beacon. Movement speed here is 25% to 35%. That is huge. The entire team, like if he engages first, the entire team gets a 35% movement speed buff. Like these, this guy doesn't want blink because you want to have, you want to have this leap to engage. You want to, you want to just drop down this beacon. Uh, and I think the AOE damage is also in a really large radius along with the beacon. I, I think that's the same target for both. Uh, so that should be very easy to confirm. I think you could actually technically hit this on the full wave, and this would be the highest instant AoE damage on the wave, even though the one is probably better for other reasons. Um, but not only that, allies who enter the beacon will gain bonus lifesteal boosted by 15% of Gilgamesh's highest protection. Highest protection meaning that it doesn't scale with uh, both physical and magical, but rather just the highest of the two. Now, it's 10% base lifesteal, and then it's plus 15% of highest protection. I had a look, you know, how much that would roughly be. If the enemy has 325, uh, is going mesh has 325 physical protection, so max at cap, then this will provide you with an extra 48.75% lifesteal, or in other words, in combination with the base lifesteal, it would be uh, roughly 60% lifesteal for this ability for all your teammates that enter the beacon now this is area limited it's kind of maybe like a uh, danzaburo but even if you don't go that crazy like even if you just get whatever 200 protections right then you'd still have um 30 percent lifesteal plus the base value here so you'd still have uh, 40 percent lifesteal overall if i did the math right in my head very quickly there uh, roughly around that anyways yeah it should be 40 so yeah <laughs> you do not want to box enemies that are in this circle because they get like they still get 17 points uh five no well, that's even more right no something like that um percent extra movement speed at the max rank and they get this extra lifesteal and he, the, the crazy part is that lifesteal doesn't even depend on the rank of the ability so even if he hasn't leveled it yet uh, as long as he's got sufficient protections it's a lot of life still to be at here. And I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, I, I think this is also interesting, especially against a magical heavy comp. Um, combination with his one uh, being uh, this this big, old, uh, big, big basic attack uh, amplifier. Uh, and then you get the life, life steal here. And then maybe you get an R along with that. You get a Shogun's Kusari or a Talisman of Energy. Um, so that you get even more attack speed. So everyone around you will have massive movement speed and massive attack speed and massive lifesteal okay so that sounds pretty scary right it sounds pretty scary to be on that area but so far you could say 
That's great. But what if I just walk away? What if I just get out? And that's where Winds of Shamash comes in. <laughs> so Winds of Shamash is the ultimate, range of 35. Uh, he creates a ring of wind at a target location for six seconds. Enemies inside the ring, uh, when it starts, uh, or like, well, enemies inside the ring take damage. The initial damage is at this value, 90 to 330 plus 50% scaling. And are slowed for two seconds, the initial slow being 20 to 30%. So, you know, the enemies have no movement speed, he drops down a circle, you're slowed. Enemies inside the ring take wind damage every 0.5 seconds. Wind damage being 12 to 28 plus 5% of your physical power. That's this scaling here. Enemies who try to escape the ring are heavily slowed. So if you get towards the edge of the ring, the slow goes up to 50 to 70%. So they, this is like, it's not, it's not a Hades pull, I guess, but it's a very heavy slow. And keep in mind, this is not the only slow in his kit. He's got another slow here. He's got another slow that even... He can slow you down while you even try to get to the ring itself. You get 30% slow here, 25% slow here. Maybe he slows you before he even starts his ring, so you just slow it in his three or something. Um, and then, <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> uh, if Gilgamesh damages an enemy trying to flee, they are thrown back towards the center of the ring. It's like a mini knockback that pulls you back in every time he damages you with anything that's not the ultimate tick itself. So if they use a basic attack, for example, you get, get pulled back. And I'm assuming it applies for other abilities as well. Still not all. The wind turns into a threat over into threat over six seconds, damaging, rooting, and crippling enemies who are still inside of the ring. It doesn't actually specify uh, how, how long this part goes on, the rooting and crippling. It's all that under data mining already. And the binding damage, the, the final damage here, is 150 to 450 plus 6% of your physical power. <laughs> All of that with an 80 to 100 mana cost and a 90 seconds cooldown. Pretty interesting. Um, so I did some numbers. Assuming this uh, tick is actually like accurate, sometimes they are a bit off, sometimes it's like one tick less or one tick more. Um, the base damage of this ability is 1116. <laughs> That's just the ultimate alone. Um, and the scaling of this is 170, which is not that high in comparison to some of the other things. Um, where this gets really interesting is the amount of locked on potential that we have in total. You have a ton of different slows here. Uh, the enemy can escape, but if your two is up, then the Gilgamesh can drop kick you into the wall of this wind which will stun you and will send you back to the middle anyways, and then you can hit you again and he can send you back to the middle anyways. Uh, all of that while also having access to a secondary slow and all of that while having extra basic tech damage that he deals to you. Uh, and all of that while ideally, if he does everything right, uh, dropping down this beacon beforehand, which provides him with extra lifesteal uh, and with extra movement speed. I, I'm fairly certain that these uh, effects here would also apply to Gilgamesh because it's, it specifies allies here, but normally uh, when allies, there's an ally effect, uh, affects himself as well. Even if it doesn't affect him, if anyone else gets to that circle, gets into the wind wall, uh, they get all these bonus effects and uh, can maim the enemy with Gilgamesh. And, and I feel like once you're locked in there, there's very little room to get out. Very little. I don't even know if it's like more worth for him to just go into just, just higher uh, power items or if it's worth to just lock enemies in there and get something at Mystical Mail and just stick to them. But I'm assuming uh, with the damage numbers he has, it's probably just worth to just, just go load up on damage and maybe some basic attack uh, amplifying things, maybe some health for the, for the one and just, yeah, just destroy them. Talisman of Energies is definitely a big one. Uh, Shogun's Kasari is a big one. If you if you are against a uh, magical heavy comp, those are great. Then in terms of... I, I, I feel like he might even... Yeah, maybe he's going to use Frostbound pretty well as well. Even more slows. Uh, keeping his one up longer. Um, maybe attack speed boots. Power boots would work as well. Uh, yeah, lots of things that you can do. And obviously you can get items randomly and decide based on that. There is one big counter to him. Uh, keep in mind that his only CC that is not tied to a slow in some form 
is the drop kick because that that comes with a stun and a knockback yeah which is good still don't get me wrong it's still very good cc and it's a very long knockback uh but what um happens here is that all of this like crippling and rooting only applies after slows so what i think the best cause of action against him will be is getting winged blade because if you get winged blade you can get out of a lot of his damaging abilities a lot of his immediate damage and uh yeah just, just gonna generally avoid that um because if you get out of the ultimate then he kind of burns a lot for it you know because that's what his kit hinges on um what i think is Something that better Gilgamesh players will probably do is position themselves so that they leap slightly in front of you, or like, like behind you, towards your tower, uh, and then put down the Winds of Shamash, and then kick you towards their own tower. Because what will happen then is that you, if you, even if you have Winged Blade, you will be temporarily stunned, and then if you run out, you have to run out in the direction of their tower, and then basically run around the Winds of Shamash area. Uh, which is a whole lot more dangerous, especially if there are enemy teammates around, than just walking out of it in the direction of your own tower. So, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting approach uh, to deal with Dropkick Daddy and to play him. And I'm very curious how strong this kit will be. I mean, numbers are always one thing and in-game is another, so I'm very curious. Because I think his... Uh, his one-on-one -on -one engage potential is insane. His team fight is uh, very good because he has these very strong amplifiers for his team. Uh, but from what I can tell, his laning might be on the rougher side. I'm not sure about this because it depends a lot on how exactly his dropkick works. If you can just use it on a minion wave with minions as well, uh, then it would be a lot easier. If you can just use this kick damage against the minions, and then one of the minions get kicked and, and the bonus damage applies. Because otherwise, you know, it, it depends heavily on the enemy's positioning. And uh, likewise, we have the, the one which could be really good for clearing after all. Because you just have that amplified damage. But I don't know how if it's going to be enough damage in early game. And it, it's only going to hit half the wave with this damage here. Uh, and the cooldown starts relatively high with 14 seconds. And this one too, and this one with 15 seconds. Like, I'm not even sure, technically it could even be possible that the 3 becomes clearing tool, but that's also very risky because then your only escape is a drop kick, which is not very escapey at all. Um, maybe more of a push back the enemy that engages on you. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think it's, it's uh, something that you can justify using as a clearing tool regularly. So yeah, it, it's going to be weird how he clears, how he gets through early, I don't know. It might possibly be very easy if the one feels sufficiently strong uh, but i can't tell from from the stats that we have here and from how the abilities interact but definitely interesting looking forward to pts in that regard it should be up on friday then we have all of his skins here as always if you want to see those then uh, have a look at the patch show uh it's very interesting ones the fun guy merlin <laughs> And here's the schedule real quick. April 6th is the bonus update. And then April 20 we'll get Gilgamesh. And yeah, that brings us to some other info. Slash is planned for the final quarter of 2021. Just so people are aware. Because some people apparently thought that it's coming out soon. Uh, some statements about it here, which I, I think I'm just going to go through because I think it's interesting. Uh, it's designed to feel both like Siege uh, rework and the Clash rework, but at the same time. Um, it's something like that when they're looking at problems with Siege, they notice that uh, aspects of Clash could be applied to help to improve it and the other way around. Um, both maps occupy a similar uh, gameplay space in Smite, higher combat, lower strategy, but with real lanes, towers, and jungle objectives. Uh, that's why they want to put it into one map, and it'll feature both Mayan and Egyptian environments. Um, and, very important, the mode will be 5v5 but using slightly more Siege mechanics than Clash mechanics. Uh, so I think it's weird that they're doing another 5v5 mode because we have so many. But I, I think, uh, I know that some people enjoy Siege specifically because it's not 5v5. Uh, but it's going to be interesting in some ways. Uh, so if they say using more Siege mechanics, I'm sure we'll see the Siege Juggernaut. I'm sure we'll see the uh, Siege Portal. And we'll probably see some jungle camps as well. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe two lanes, but further apart as well. More similar to Siege in that regard. Um, and then maybe more like, maybe an Apophis for spawning the Siege, or maybe a, a buff 
objective secondary, something like that. That seems to be the vibe at the moment. But it's not finalized yet anyway, so we'll see how it goes. Um, free rewards uh, had some things where it didn't work out before properly. Um, but it's now fully enabled on PC and Xbox. Uh, PS4 has been released. PS5 is still in development. Uh, Switch doesn't support it, so they will never have uh, access to this reward. That's the Switch thing. And uh, yeah, they're still testing some things with that. But yeah, it'll, it'll be random for a while, they say. And uh, Baba Yaga is getting some quality of life improvements. She's actually getting a buff here where her self root uh, during the ultimate is uh, shorter. And uh, generally her ult should work better and the projectile should actually fire properly and shouldn't jitter as much and all that. So that should feel a whole lot better. Uh, yeah, we have some audio stuff. Lo we all have a login queue as well. So sometimes you'll take a, a really long time to log in and you wonder why that is. And apparently you're part of a queue in that moment. And now this queue will actually show so you know why it's sometimes taking a while to log in. It's not actually your browser or like your client, but rather the queue. And yeah, I think that's all of this part. Then we have some UI fixes, free rewards, uh, gameplay fixes. I think those are mostly minor ones. Um, this one is important. Fix an issue where players could not queue with friends with the MMR range uh, in certain cases, uh, such as playing with a friend who has not played ranked that season or playing with a teammate in Masters. So these restrictions are fixed. Um, oh yeah, and... Um, the 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 region uh, fix that was weird you could like sometimes get kicked into the wrong region um if you change your region and it didn't change back properly basically uh i'm trying to see if it's here no they basically what they also did is they, they fixed the ui issue uh, where god icons wouldn't show up but for some reason it's not listed here maybe it already happens before this then we have some skin fixes here some effect fixes um apparently the Raw skin, Unholy Doodle, was actually meant to have other effects. No one pointed out during the patch notes, um, and no one pointed it out until recently, and then Ajax said, oh yeah, that had missing effects. So the two and the ultimate actually intended to have different effects, so those should um, be better. And uh, also, I, I think this is also referring to Unholy Doodle. Um, change the motion of the ability one visual effects to be faster and tighter, keeping more closer to the intended hit area. Um, I'm assuming it's for Raw Doodle because that is the one that's moving around and a lot of people were unhappy with that, understandably so. Because if you quickly glance at it, you can't really tell the direction sometimes because it's just wiggling around. Yeah, okay, that's all of these. Uh, Sentinel's Boon, fix an issue where those items pass was killing, uh, it was triggering on kills as well as assists instead of just assists. Also interesting. And uh, Midgardian Mail <laughs> did stack with other attack speed slots. So <laughs> if you still want to use that, until 8.4, Midgardian Mail still stacks with other attack speed slots. I don't know which ones, but even though it's meant to not do that, does that. We have a Conquest update. The Rising Storm. We can skip the lore part here because it's not really that important. But two parts here. Okay, we'll see that in a bit. Cool. Um, first, vines. There are vines on the map now. Um, I don't know. I hope you can see them. Maybe let, let me zoom in a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, next to the harpy camps on both sides. Here they completely wall off the pathing. Uh, here you can kind of walk around them, it seems. And then next to the gold fury. Uh, these vines can be destroyed with two basic attacks. And uh, they block vision. I don't know if they... I don't think they block projectiles. Um, but I think that, yeah, they, they just function like play mate walls. So you can, you can get... Anything that goes through a wall will go through that. Um, but you cannot walk through them. And you have to basic attack them twice. And uh, they respawn when the adjacent jungle camp respawns. So... You have to kill the... Uh, the harpy or whatever it is that's that's near the jungle camp in order for them to to respawn in the first place but they all despawn at uh, 15 seconds uh, 15 minutes so they're not permanently there for the whole game but rather for the early game and i think it's an interesting mechanic i think it's a fun mechanic uh, for jungle pathing forcing certain pathings uh making 
this choke point here as well, potentially, if you don't basic attack them down beforehand, if you don't go this pathing, then if you go through here, you're in a choke point immediately. Uh, and I like that, because mid-contesting at the moment is a little bit boring anyway, so make it more interesting. I dig it. Uh, then you can see the, the vines here. That's what they look like. And here, what you can see is the new skybox, and I absolutely hate it. That's just me. I've had my vent about this, but uh, if you want to see that, you can watch the live patch notes. It's a very dark skybox. It makes the whole visuals of the rest of the map darker as well. Like, it, you know, this area was like more lit up before. It's all dark now. Uh, and there's occasional thunderstorms. I don't like dark maps. I think Conquest is way too much of a quirky... Uh, Spike is way too much of a quirky, funny game with all their funny skins, the uh, long cut Yemen Gunders and what have you. I don't think they need this serious, grim theme. I think it's very unfitting. But that's my opinion, anyways. I was just so happy that we finally had a nice, <laughs> brightly colored, sunny map, and then they do this to me. Uh, anyways, anyways, I'm rambling. Uh, there are... Yeah, okay, now let's just mention where, where it is. Basically, um, this is just the, the imagery where it's shown now. And there's an, another new tech, which is also interesting. Invisible foliage tech. When gods use an aerial ultimate, the leaves on trees within their ability range will now become invisible temporarily. This effect will only trigger when the gods rise above a certain height. So, for example, Cthulhu ult, uh, probably Yom and ult, Daji ult, uh, Apollo, Thor, all of those, when they go up, basically make the trees disappear. And that makes it much easier to aim your ultimates in the jungle, which I thought was an interesting mechanic. I thought hiding under the trees was kind of a cool mechanic, but apparently Harris doesn't really want that. And I think it's fair enough for some gods like Daji, who's got significantly enough through this. But for others, I don't know, Apollo doesn't really need more buffs, so... Um, yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was a nice mechanic, and I thought I would have rather seen them, like... Thin out the foliage a bit in certain areas where it's too problematic, but they didn't want that. Tier 2 towers get a little bit more uh, HP. Base HP increased from 2,500 to 2,800, and the base damage per shot uh, increased from two, uh, 260 to 290. Seems a bit out of nowhere, but sure. Um, the Greater Scorpion also gets changes. Uh, once again, the, make, uh, the base max health is decreased from 780 to 660. The base protections from 20 to 14 and the scaling health from 175 to 145 as well as the scaling physical protection from 2 to 1.5 and the scaling magical protection from 2 to 1. This is important. Uh, initially it wasn't scaling properly, then they fixed it, then they realized it's very strong scaling now and now they're tuning it down a bit. Uh, I gotta say, especially as a jungle, this feels very frustrating to clear. Uh, if your teammates ever don't rotate, you take so much damage from it because it also doesn't restore health with Bumbas. Uh, so I think it's fair enough that they adjust this uh, and that they, they make this uh, a little bit more uh, appealing to fight solo if you want to, uh, and otherwise obviously easy to clear with the team as well. The Manticore uh, has his physical power scaling in Berserk, uh, reduced from 18 damage to 15 per hit, which is interesting if you're solo clearing a red a little bit later into the game as, as the mid laner. You sometimes would take a lot of damage otherwise. Base gates added new rules uh, linking Phoenix death to doors. Killing left Phoenix removes the debuff area on the left door. Killing the right Phoenix removes the debuff uh, area on the right door. Uh, and killing the middle Phoenix removes the debuff area for both doors. Very interesting. I don't know if the delay will still be there, probably. Um, but, you know, if you clear one Phoenix and you want to get another angle on the other Phoenix, then this is an option to do that, I suppose. Even though not only you could just walk around in most situations. But if it's an instant door opener, it would be very strong. I, I don't think it will be, but if it is, then it's very strong. Especially if you get down to the middle Phoenix, then you can just walk freely into their base at that point uh, through three different entrances instead of just one. Okay, item nerfs. Bamba Sama, uh, this item no longer procs on immune jungle camps. Doesn't make that much of a difference uh, because most Bamba Samba users are melee and usually don't get in situations where jungle camps are immune. More important, Death Toll and Death Embrace get the same treatment and will no longer proc on immune jungle camps, which means you can no longer heal up in the lane on the scorpion that's standing there by just basic attacking it, uh, and you can no longer heal up easily in late game by just spamming Death Embrace basic attacks on a camp. So I think those 
are very good changes and very needed changes. I don't know why it took so long, to be honest. Very interesting changes on other items, though, that might actually bring us some competition. On it, Arrow gets a whole uh, set of changes. This item now provides 10% attack speed. This item now provides 5% critical strike chance. Passive. Decrease the maximum stack count from 25 to 20. So 2,500 gold down to 2,000. Increased attack speed per stack uh, from 1% to 1.25% per stack. So a total of 25% at max stacks, which is the same as before, but with less gold required. Increased critical strike chance from 0.8 per stack to 1% per stack, 20% uh, at max stacks, which is also the same as before. So effectively, these values here uh, only change so far that you need less gold to achieve them, but you get these two extra values. And prior to this, uh, Onnit Arrow was really, really weird in terms of stats distribution, um, where essentially in some situations it would almost be better to just not get it at all and just buy a crit item and it would still be better than this which costs you more than 2000 gold and requires 2500 gold to be fully stacked so now i think it's in a more interesting place where it really has those beefy late game stats uh, that justify considering it uh, i will have a deeper look at that in the future and then we'll talk about it more but i think this is a very interesting change likewise leader's cowl gets a buff as well this item now provides 15% attack speed. Okay, so it actually has a stat that makes sense for hunters. That is the start. Additionally, Aura, you provide 5% increased power to all nearby guards. This Aura gains a bonus stack for each ally guard within X units, causing uh, to provide an additional 3% increased power. For each enemy guard within X units, a stack is removed. So it'll always always, always provide 5% increased power now. Then, in addition to that, it can provide additional power if you're in any position where your team has more players. In situations where that's not the case, you still have 5% additional power and you still have 15% attack speed. It's not going to be as good as, as Hunter's Call in those situations, I think, because Hunter's Call you know, has that team attack speed aura as well, which, especially with Gilgamesh coming in, it's gonna see some use, I think. Um, but I do think that the aura here is very interesting now. I think there are certain guards that just benefit a lot from 5% increased power. Uh, and you can kind of build a team around stuff like that if you get a... What is it called? A rallying flag? No, whatever. That, that flag upgrade um, that uh, gives you additional power as well. And then you get this. And then you maybe get in a position where you get one kill or where an enemy is late to the fight, uh, and then suddenly your leader's cowl might actually be paying off. And now it could be something you, you could consider on, on solo laners as well, maybe in late game, uh, if if you're a skipping starter, or maybe possibly even starting with a leather cowl on a... Bologna? I don't know. Uh, there, there are options. There, there are things where you can think about this now, whereas before, and it was just like, why would you even think about this? And also... Uh, very important, if you use this on objectives now, that's a whole lot of power. If you if you get any objective uncontested, if any, there's any situation where the enemy is late to rotation on an objective, you guys have so much more power than the enemy team, and, and that was good before, that was the strong part of it, but it was just not justified with the rest of the stats. Now we'll see if we actually have some hunters in this game that are team players. That's what we have to find out. Otherwise, I see this one being used on solos, but uh, it's definitely a much more interesting item. We have Sentinel's Embrace. This gets a nerf, technically, but I think it's a buff. So, why? Increased passive aura range from 30 to 55 units. Increased physical protection from 30 to 40, uh, from 20 to 30, and increased magical protection from 20 to 30. Decreased protection split among nearby allies from 100 to 80. Decreased protection gains while alone from 50 to 40. So, uh, this part and this part combined means your protections on your own are exactly the same as before. There's more base protections on the item, um, but uh, some less on the passive for you yourself. However, the split protections are lower. And that's where um, you will see significant impact because... 
usually you will not give your team as much protection. And that was the big problem. Sentinels Embrace just providing so much protection to allies. But the reason why I think this is a buff is because previously the range here was 30 units. And 30 units in Smite is not very much. And there are many situations where you as a support are too far away from your carry, from your mage, from the one who needs the protection, and they're going, they don't get anything. Now, Hyra's argument here was, yeah, um, the, the nerf here effectively is that the protections are more spread out between multiple allies, uh, and obviously they're lower, uh, so they get less. And that's true, that is correct. But the point is that in many situations, they will now have protections where they otherwise wouldn't have had protections in the first place. And in all of those situations, you're obviously better off giving them at least some protections. I think it's it's more worth to like multi-stack uh, defensive ours, but that's already being done. So yeah, I think it's a buff because it's more likely that you'll actually get a soft and a sentence embrace on an ally at the same time or something like that. Obviously there are other item options as well in the support trees. Uh, that are getting buffs, and one of those is Compassion. But I think Sentinel's Embrace is still very, very strong, even after these changes. So, Compassion. Increased passive aura range from 40 to 70 units. Uh, again, um, these unit rate changes are drastic, and I think they're very strong. And this is even bigger here, because the Sentinel's Embrace goes to 55 units, but Compassion goes up to 70 units. So that's a really big radius. Uh, increased magical protection from 40 to 60. This is so that you take less damage when you absorb damage for your team. Uh, increased HP 5 from 30 to 45. I still have to look uh, into the numbers once again now and uh, check how they compare uh, with Sentinel's Embrace, with the protections it provides. I think these items are getting closer to each other. I think that the race is starting to be more between the tier 1s, where I, I think just... Sentinel's Gift is still such a strong tier 1 that it's kind of uh, hard to uh, compete. But um, I think especially in matchups uh, where the enemy team is heavily focused on magical damage, where they have three magicals, which is not that common at the moment, but when they do, um, Compassion could be worth considering more because on one hand you get the passive, but on the other hand you also just get a, a bulk of magical protection from building it. Um, so you have to worry about that part less. And the other very interesting aspect here is the very high HP 5, 45 HP 5. Um, th that is a pretty good amount of sustain. If you're walking around for 30 seconds, that's like, what, almost 300 health, not quite. But uh, So, yeah, I, I think that is, um, I think it's a good change. I think it's a good buff. Uh, and I think we're actually seeing some potential starter upgrade put competition, even though I feel like it might still swing a little bit in favor of Sentinels. So we'll find out, but I, I like these changes to both items, actually. Sundering X gets a change as well, and this one is concerning. Decreased bonus damage from 10% of the enemy's current health to 5% of the current health, plus 2% of your total protections from items. Uh, maximum bonus damage is 14% of the enemy's current health. Requires 400 total protections to reach cap. Um, I don't think it's that hard to reach 400 total protections. <laughs> and I think if you do, you're getting rewarded pretty hard. So the change here has a reason, it has logic. It's because uh, the item was used by mages and they don't want them like to, you know, they think it's interesting, but they think they, that mages shouldn't get too much burst from it. Um, but uh, yeah, mages felt better with it than warriors, effectively. But I think Sundering X did not need a buff at the highest scaling. I think if they just put it at a 5% plus uh, up to up to 10% cap, with a lower cap protections if you want, that would have been fine. Say like 300 protections and, and you get cap or something, uh, and it's 10%. But I don't think they needed to increase that to 14%, which is steel by the way, it's not just, it's, it's true damage and you get that health back. And it's, it's what, is, what is it, like 6 seconds cooldown? I think this may be one of the most impactful buffs for items in this patch, actually. Um, that makes it very strong on solos. Now, I, I just said, like, uh, there are more interesting items for solos now, leaders, cow and stuff. 
I just don't know why why it has to be this strong. That's like there are other solo items that you know would be interesting to build that will not be built because of Thundering X unless they get equally buffed. Um, Thundering X, I think, was generally agreed upon to be one of the strongest upgrades, and you know, normally like Death Tall and Bombas they're nerfing the strongest upgrades with Thundering X. They're kind of <laughs> buffing it. Kind of weird. Kind of weird. At least you have to build protections along with it, I suppose. If you don't want to build protections, Hyrus got you covered as well. They are like, yo, no, no, our solos, solos need to do a lot of damage no matter where they are. So Bluestone Pendant gets a physical power increase uh, from 10 to 15. Um, yeah, fair enough. You know, it, it can have a little buff. It, it fell off a little bit after all the changes and everything. Um, but Bluestone Brooch. Gets a completely out of nowhere buff. Increase the base damage of the passive from 25 to 75. And and they say this is because it wasn't on the same level as other starter upgrades, but I'm like, the other bluestone upgrade is worse for the vast majority of characters and the vast majority of situations. I don't know of many characters that actually use it, like Set can use it, and, and then beyond that, I don't really know who even considered using it at this point. Uh, but, but Bluestone Brooch was not the worst starter upgraded by, by a large margin. And they're buffing this heavily. 50 base damage ticking, but on every, um, on every instance of this. And uh, keep in mind that some gods like King Arthur can just proc this over and over and over and over and over. That is a truckload of damage. And... It feels like this buff was only done for it to compete with Sundering X when realistically there was no need to buff it to make it compete with Sundering X because there was no need to buff Sundering X. Um, and this already got a buff recently that increased the health a lot, so... I don't know. Kind of weird. Kind of uncalled for. But that's what they decided to do with it, I suppose. Uh, very strange changes in the in the solo warrior department there. That I, I don't really understand. I don't really understand why they think that's needed. Maybe they, they played it on ability hunters and they felt like it didn't do enough on ability hunters. Which is fair enough. It doesn't feel that good on ability hunters. I've tried it and I was not happy with it either. But... Why? <laughs> why King Arthur? Why? Um, the alternate timeline. Decrease cooldown from 10 minutes to 6 minutes. <laughs> the alternate timeline is built more on tanks than on mages, I think, at this point. And um, for tanks, I think this is a very interesting buff, because eh, depending on what you're playing, who you're playing, how you're playing, you might not actually die that often as a tank. And then a six-minute cooldown actually makes a pretty significant difference. For mages, on the other hand, I don't know. I think as a mage, no matter how short the cooldown, you'll, you'll get blown up and you come back and you get blown up again most of the time. Like, yeah, maybe Persephone will pick it up now, but it's, it's not one. Staff of Murden, fix an issue where this item was on training at the same time uh, as the ultimate fires uh, as the other Ethereum items. So for some items it was uh, after the ultimate ended and for some other items it was when it's fired and that's... Like one of the examples that they mentioned was Hera, where it's, it's procs after Argus dies, which is obviously not ideal, so they, it should be better now overall. It should be a good fix. And I think Mustafa Murder is actually a pretty good item right now. It has a lot of nice stats that, like, that supplement a build towards the end of the game. Like, you, you want to have some CDR and some percentage pen or something. And we have some item, uh, some, some guard changes as well after the item changes. Achilles, Shield of Achilles, decreased cooldown from 15 to 14 seconds. Still a long cooldown, so not really a bad thing here. And Fatal Strike decreased the bonus damage taken from 10 to 5%. I think uh, those are reasonable buffs because he's not really doing well. Um, yeah, dropped to some of his lowest numbers in both players' perception and win percentage lately. Uh, I think that the nerfs here aren't going to majorly destroy him. Uh, yeah, the buffs are not going to majorly improve him all the way around. Um, this one second cooldown is something you will barely notice in most situations. 
And the Fatal Strike, uh, to me, in a situation where you can get Fatal Strike off and you can actually get an Execute off, that is usually in a situation with Achilles where you're already in a position to take down the rest of the enemies. Sure, not always, but usually, uh, you know, at the moment of the fight where you're like, okay, now I can ult him, now it's worth it, get the Execute, and then you engage on the next enemy, and, and try and get another execute and so on. That's usually not the moment where you really care about taking a little bit more damage anymore in my eyes. Maybe that's subjective. Um, maybe that's just my play style that, that makes it so, but I feel like that's how it usually goes. So I think this will not have a major impact. I think what he rather needs is maybe something that makes his laning a little bit more effective. Where this change comes in, but again, very small one. Then we have a Bacchus. Uh, Bacchus didn't do too well either, generally. Like, he's just not a conquest god overall. Um, and he gets buffs. Decreased mana cost from 40 to 20 at all ranks. Decreased cooldown from 10 to 8 seconds. And then uh, some fixing for description. But overall, um, this means he should be able to use it more frequently and get less punished for using it. And I think that's good. Considering how much mana cost you used to have at some point, I think it's good that they're moving far, far away from that. Just, you know, a little bit for the protections. A little bit of mana cost is justified. Also have some starters that could potentially help with that now. And then Belge of the Guards. Increase the damage, base damage from 25 to 85 uh, to 30 to 90 per tick. And I think it's four ticks. So I think this is a 20 damage increase. Uh, and this is... This is interesting in so far. I think it's 120 uh, damage, rank 1, uh, if I looked at it right. Um, that it should help quite a fair bit with early clearing, with early pressure, um, which he struggles with. And obviously, there's still going to be guards that interrupt him. But then even if he gets interrupted, uh, at least he gets some more damage off beforehand. So I think these buffs are more than fair. And I'd, I'd love to see some more Bacchus. I think Bacchus is such an interesting character that we really don't see much of. And we have Yomaganda. Consuming Bellow, increase the duration of the empowered attack speed buff from 1 second to 1.5 seconds. Okay. <laughs> That's a great one. That I, I, I'm sure people would care about the attack speed buff. However, uh, the other part is, is interesting. Submerge, uh, reduce the cooldown from 16 seconds to 16 down to 12 seconds. I think that uh, gives them a little bit more CC potential in a fight especially. Even if you're playing him in, in solo or in support. And I think that's a good change. Uh, and along with that, um, also gives him some more escape potential in a fight. And he also he already has a lot of escape potential through his ultimate. But this means that he can a little bit more freely like engage with the three, use your kit, use your ult, and then maybe get out with the three again after that. Something like that. So I think that's a good set of changes. Okay, let's read this. Uh, let's just read this one out. Just, just try and understand what they were thinking in this one. Merlin. The time has come for Merlin buffs. Because that time wasn't just like, you know, in, in I think 8.1 or something when they buffed his fire. He, they literally just buffed him. This gut has dropped off heavily over the years while getting a variety of nerfs. He got a buff. He got a buff last. Recently, we have been focusing on bringing up his fire stance, often regarded as the weakest one. The protection shred has been pivoted to only work on guards now, but it's generally very hard to stack, which heavily limits its impact. This is going to be much stronger on the first tick now, leveling out about the same amount when hitting all ticks in late game. Fire stance should now be more attractive to switch in, especially when trying to focus down <coughs> an enemy tank. Dragon fire. Increased protection reduced uh, per stack from 0.5 uh, to 2.5% per stack, to 4% at all ranks, decreased maximum stacks from 6 to 4. So this results from um, god only protection reduction from 3 to 15% depending on the rank uh, to 16% at all ranks at max stacks. <laughs> so it's in immediately, even if you just apply a single tick, it's immediately more shred immediately 4% shred, um, probably in most situations I would say 8% shred, and then more if they don't get out, uh, if you center it on them. On the other hand, the stacks are decreased from 6 to 4, which means 
you get more damage anyways, because in every situation you still get more damage. But it means it's, it's easier to reach max stacks as well. Venenu said, when we made the tiers, Venenu said that it's already worth switching into fire stance for his one. Because they changed the ticks, how that works. It's much easier to apply. And now the buffing dragon fire as well, so it applies a ton of shred. If you get locked down by any CC, Merlin gets his two on you. He lose 16% of your protections, and then you get absolutely fried by his one. Happy birthday. Completely out of nowhere. I think Merlin is fine in a position where he doesn't have a high win rate. Because Merlin is meant to be hard to play, even though Ajax is initially denied that. Um, he has a complex kit where when you're using him effectively, you want to use all of his stances. And good players can make him work. And he's not flavor of the month right now. And that's completely okay. And I don't think he needed that buff. So I'll say. Neath. Spirit Arrow. Decreased cooldown from 15 seconds to 15 down to 13 seconds. A kind of interesting change. Uh, didn't really expect that one. But then she's not been a prominent meta pick. And I guess as one of the, the uh, poster children of Smite. She needs to be somewhat in the meta, and maybe this will bring her back. I think the bigger problem for her right now is that the Starless just don't pay off that much for her. So yeah, make of that what you will. Ulleran gets his base power increase from 38 to 40, and his critical strike chance, uh, his critical strike damage of Touch of Fate uh, increased from 50 to 55%. Um, I wish they would have just increased his crit rate instead of something, because... I think it's like much easier to to just remember 50% and, and calculate that quickly than 55%, you know, know how much damage you'll deal with something. Uh, but yeah, they, they decided that this is the way they'll do it now. Unfortunate, but it's their choice. I think overall buffs for him are reasonable. And mage ADCs haven't really been doing all too well, with the exception of uh, maybe Kronos. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think buffs are justified. Circuit Catalyst. Stacks will only be consumed and extra damage dealt if Circuit successfully damages the guard, which effectively means block stacks will not absorb the passive, which effectively means shell, upgrade shell, will not ruin Circuit's passive. That's all that is. And maybe Athena. And then. Oh, apparently, okay, apparently uh, Aegis countered this as well. Aegis absorbed this as well. Uh, which is kind of important against Saket, I suppose, uh, or for Saket. And then last breath, increased power scaling from 55% to 70%. Uh, I initially thought that would be a lot, but it's actually okay. It's actually like, uh, yeah, whatever. It, 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 the, the values that you get out of that, the extra values aren't that insane that you'd be like, wow, she's going to obliterate everyone now. I think Saket's got a lot of problems in the current meta. I think... Um, she especially doesn't really like the fact that neither Bambas nor Mannequins are, are really ideal for her. Uh, because you don't really want to use them on her. Maybe you want to use Mannequin Hidden Blade, but then the stats don't really work for you. Bambas Hammer, you are what you end up using because it's the strongest item. But it kind of works against the passive. Um, yeah, so I think it's fair that she gets something in return here. Sylvanas, uh, increased basic attack damage from 35 to 38%, and Verdant Growth increased magical power scaling from 35 to 50%. Basic attack damage, okay. Um, Mannequin Sylvanas is going to go out of style with the mannequin changes, so having something else here to, to build a more serious support build, I think, is, is fine. Uh, Verdant Growth, magical power scaling, surprising to me. Um, I don't think he needs more scaling, really. He's got, a, he's got some quite high scaling abilities, but also not something that would drastically change him, I think, overall. Tiamat. A lot. Uh, Death begets life. The damage mitigation is reduced from 60% to 30% and 5% of Tiamat's magical power, capping at total 60% uh, at 600 magical power. 
So this is weird. Um, the reason they gave is that in some situations she gets too much mitigation, especially when played in solo and played bruiser. But I have not really seen Tiamat solo being an issue compared to Tiamat mid. Uh, I, I do think that Tiamat bruiser is very interesting, but I don't see the point in making it scale. Because that effect of, like, the problem with the mitigation is usually that in late game, she just can't be bursted if she goes into melee form. The problem that I see is that she kind of still can't be bursted in late game if she reaches 600 power. Even if she's at 500 power, you'll still have more than enough uh, mitigation at that point. So I, I don't really know what this change is, is, is trying to achieve, and I've been trying to understand it since I first saw it, and I still don't really get it. Like, I suppose it's primarily to nerf her early mitigations in middle, which is fair, I guess, but you're not really going to switch into melee stance in early and middle anyways if you're smart, so, like, not much, at least, only to escape, and then you leap away anyway, so. Uh, this is a weird one to me. I think nerfs are warranted. Um, I know some people think they're not, but I think Tiamat is very strong, especially on the high levels of play. She is definitely becoming an issue. Um, but yeah, this one's weird. The next one, Summon Serpents. The decreased number of hits it takes uh, for minions to damage a Serpent health pip from 3 to 2. So they get cleared a little bit easier there. I honestly think they should also make it so that Towers just one-shot a Serpent, but hey. Uh, and then decreased power scaling from 8% to 5% of Tiamat's magical power. I think they should not make scale at all, or, or even lower, because with this change, they encourage high power builds. And then this means that the, as long as the uh, Serpents have scaling, they will remain a major frustration factor. But maybe minions taking some health from them means the split pushing is a little bit harder. We'll find out. Uh, and then she also gets a buff to something else, which is Summon Storm. Um, First of all, adjust the description text to clarify that the initial damage uh, is on the first hit uh, of each target, not the deploy of the ability. That's actually good. I wasn't uh, actually sure about that either. But then uh, the initial hit damage scaling is increased from 30% of your uh, magical power to 40%, and the tick damage scaling uh, is increased from 10% of your magical power to 12% per tick. Um, since she's not really uh, ticking, uh, she's not really dealing too much damage in her mage from alone, even with a full power build, I can see why they changed this, and that's why like Storm wasn't even necessarily always used. Uh, the overarching problem remains, I think, her split push potential, and then going off into a team fight on the other side of the map uh, is still very high, and I think that's the most frustrating part about her. But I think this is a good set of tweaks. I mean, more nerfs than buffs, obviously, but uh, giving her a little bit in return in a place where it's useful is also good. And Ethereum items should work properly with her ultimates as well, so that's good. And last but not least, uh, Shang-Chi gets a buff to expose evil, increasing the magical power scaling from 15% to 20%, so 75 to 100 in total. Lots of changes here. Very interesting stuff. Uh, I like most of them, and some I find a little bit questionable, as usual. Um, I'm very sad that they made the Congress map dark again. I hope that's just temporary. I am very excited for Gilgamesh. Uh, there are some changes that I would like to see still, but I mean... Overall, I would say, between the two patch changes here, like, they did a pretty good job. And that's it for this video. If you're new to the channel, feel the sub button, move the bell. And on that, I hope to see you for the next one soon. Deesloth, out.